At the beginning of this video, I briefly mentioned the Osage Nation in reference to the location that this story takes place. The history of the Osage Nation is complex, vast and interesting, so I've included some links in the description. The story begins in Labette County, Kansas, which was part of the Osage Nation territory. They were the most powerful tribal group in the early history of Missouri and referred to themselves as Wasage, which means the water people or children of the middle waters. I just wanted to add something for clarification. Apologies for the bad audio. Labette County itself was not part of the core Osage Nation territory. The Osage Trail passed through Labette County. It played an important role for the Osage and other tribes, allowing them to access various resources and establish connections with neighbouring communities. As European colonisation of North America expanded, the United States signed 368 treaties with various indigenous people across the North American continent, and one of these treaties forced the Osage people to give up their Kansas territory and relocate to a reservation in Oklahoma. It's well known that the result of these treaties was devastating for the indigenous tribes. In 1870, five families of spiritualists travelled along the Osage Trail to settle in Labette County, a few miles from what would later become the township of Cherry Vale. For the European settlers, living with the high temperatures on the windswept prairie, life was tough, and within a few months, only three of the five families remained. Among these, the Bender family. John Bender Sr., wife Alvira Bender, son John Jr. and daughter Kate. It's believed that John Bender Sr. immigrated from Germany. He was a large man with broad shoulders and he might have been over six feet tall, if not for his stooped posture. His spoken English was limited mostly to grunting and profanity. John Bender Jr. was a tall and slender young man in his mid-twenties with auburn hair. He had a strong German accent and a habit of laughing awkwardly, which gave the impression that he wasn't too bright. However, this could have been a facade, as he always seemed to be carefully listening and observing. Elvira Bender, also known as Ma Bender, was a heavy-set middle-aged woman. Like her family members, she spoke with a German accent. Born Almira Mark, she married young and became Almira Griffith. She had multiple children and was widowed several times, with each husband allegedly dying from head wounds under suspicious circumstances. Elvira was a spiritualist who performed incantations and used boiled roots and herbs to create charms and spells. She was known for being ruthless, tenacious and having such a vicious temper that her neighbours referred to her as a she-devil. 23-year-old Kate Bender stood at around 5 foot 6 with hazel eyes and dark auburn hair. She was graceful and confident with excellent social skills and a strong command of English. She was friendly, charming and flirtatious and she could easily draw in any man who caught her eye. However, beneath the seemingly sweet exterior, Kate had a much darker side. Her moods were mercurial and her driving force was an unquenchable thirst for wealth and notoriety and she allowed nothing to get in her way. She briefly worked as a waitress and soon discovered that she could cash in on spiritualism. She handed out flyers claiming to have supernatural powers and abilities, including being able to cure diseases and ailments and even communicate with the dead. She gave lectures and seances and spoke openly about free love and the justification for murder. I should point out that in the mid-1800s, the free love movement and spiritualism were strongly linked to the women's movement, advocating for women's rights and challenging the institution of marriage. I'm not so sure what she meant by the justification for murder, but we'll get to that later anyway. She sold charms and potions and read fortunes and did palm readings and provided astrology and numerology services all for a generous fee and many were persuaded by Kate and her charms. No doubt had she been alive today, she'd be making a killing on social media as a spiritual influencer. Although it is widely believed that the Benders were German immigrants, there's no documentation or definitive proof of their origin. It is believed that only Elvira and Kate were actually related as mother and daughter, 
with Elvira using the second name of her first husband, George Griffith. John Sr.'s real last name was Flickinger, and he was sometimes referred to as William, and John Jr.'s last name was Gebhardt, and many who knew them in Kansas said Kate and John were not siblings, but were in fact husband and wife. Having travelled ahead with the other spiritualist families, John Sr. and John Jr. settled on a 160-acre parcel of land on the south side of the Osage Trail between the mounds, several miles away from where modern-day U.S. Highway 400 meets Highway 169. John Jr. chose a narrow plot just north of John Sr. However, this remained undeveloped and it was on the other plot that they began building a 16 by 24 timber cabin with a root cellar and a well. And by 1871, the lodging was complete and word was sent for Ma Bender and Kate to join them. And so the two women set off in a canvas-covered wagon. Their first stop was to buy furniture and supplies before continuing on to Labet County. The canvas wagon cover was used to create a partition in the cabin. It was divided into two rooms, with living quarters at the rear, and the front area was used as a small grocery store and an inn, where travellers on the Osage Trail could eat, rest and grab some supplies. They planted a small orchard near the house, and by all appearances, the Benders were just like any other family of settlers who came west for a new life. The southeast corner of Kansas was a popular destination for settlers, seeking land and livestock. Some of these settlers would trade horses as partial payment for their claims, while others carried large sums of money. The area was infamous for theft and robbery, and a person going missing along with their horses and wagons and personal property didn't tend to attract much attention. Since the area was rife with violent crime, they were generally seen as just another unfortunate case. In May 1871, the first of a number of reports was made about people disappearing while travelling through Labette County. In Drum Creek, which would later become Montgomery County, the body of a man was found with a throat laceration and severe head trauma. In February 1872, two more bodies were found with the same injuries. As the frequency of such reports increased, many travellers became afraid and would avoid the trail. In an effort to bring the perpetrators to justice, locals formed vigilante groups and made arrests, but suspects were later released by the authorities. Anger and mob mentality resulted in false suspicion and harassment of innocent individuals who were then driven out of town. In 1873, Dr. William Henry York, a renowned physician, was notified of a discovery involving horses and a carriage that he had loaned to his recently widowed neighbour, George Longcore, who had left with his infant daughter to relocate from Kansas to Iowa. Concerned for his friend's well-being, Dr. York set out on a search, and he travelled along the Osage Trail questioning homesteaders along the way, until he finally reached Fort Scott. And it was there that he identified the horses and carriage, as well as some of Longcore's clothing. Sadly, Longcore was nowhere to be found, and it appeared that he and his daughter had never made it out of Kansas. On March the 9th, 1873, Dr. York started his return journey to his home in Independence, but he never arrived. Dr. York was from a well-respected family, and one of his brothers was Lieutenant Colonel Alexander M. York, who was a member of the Kansas State Senate, and when William disappeared, his brother sprang into action, gathering a group of folks who searched everywhere, including the Bender Inn. But the Benders claimed that they'd never seen William and suggested that maybe he'd run into trouble near Drum Creek, which was where the other incidents had happened. But without any hard evidence, they couldn't do much more to find him. Then a woman came forward to report that during a visit to the Bender Inn, Ma Bender had pulled out a gun and threatened her, which caused her to flee from the inn. Colonel York decided to question Mrs. Bender, who pretended that she didn't understand English, but then made the mistake of yelling in English that the woman had cursed her coffee. The Osage Township became the focus of slander and rumours in neighbouring areas, and so a meeting was called, which resulted in a search warrant for every farmstead between the headwaters of Big Hill Creek and Drum Creek. Among the meeting attendees were two men, John Bender Sr. and John Bender Jr., Nowadays, this search could easily happen over a day or two. But in this era, horses were the most common means of transportation, and the search was also postponed due to bad weather. And several days later, 
a neighbour of the Benders noticed that the farm animals on the property appeared to be starving, and on closer inspection, he discovered that the inn had been abandoned. The township officer gathered a team of men to investigate the deserted property, and found that much of the Benders' personal possessions were gone. As they entered the cabin, they were met by a foul stench, which seemed to emanate from a trapdoor which was nailed shut on the floor of the cabin. They pried it open and found a root cellar along with the source of the putrid odour. Pools of clotted blood had seeped through into the soil and dried. Obviously horrified, they began to search for remains, but they found nothing, so they decided to lift and move the whole cabin so that they could dig underneath it. But again they found nothing, so the search was expanded to the surrounding land which included the orchard and the well. And it was there, in the orchard, that Colonel York found the rotting remains of his brother, Dr William York. Further searchers uncovered ten other bodies buried in the garden and the well. And like the victims found in Drum Creek, their throats had been slashed and their skulls were crushed and some had been mutilated. The search concluded and no more remains were recovered on the property. However, it's important to note that there is no widely accepted list of victims and the identities of many of the people who were murdered by the Bender family remain unknown. The remains of 11 bodies were recovered, but many people believe that the Benders may have killed over 21 people. From the evidence and remains, it was learned that unsuspecting travellers would be lured into the inn for a meal and a place to stay for the night. Once the guests were seated at the dinner table, One of the benders would strike them from behind with a hammer. Their throats were slashed and after retrieving any valuables, their bodies would be dropped into the root cellar before later being buried on the property. The remote location of the inn, which was in a notorious dangerous area, and the fact that they targeted travellers meant that their crimes had gone unnoticed for some time. By the time the authorities had arrived, the benders had already fled. Rewards for up to $2,000 were offered in return for the information or the apprehension of the Bender family, but they were never claimed. Over 3,000 people flocked to visit what was now being referred to as Hell's Half Acre, with reporters travelling from as far away as New York. The rumour mill churned out everything, from the usual speculation to outrageous conspiracies. And amidst the half-truths and eyewitness accounts, several vengeful posses claimed to have found them taken them out and conveniently disposed of their remains. And so, law enforcement took many trips to investigate the rumours and numerous reports of sightings, but none of the claims turned out to be true. The Benders' abandoned wagon and starving horses, however, were discovered by detectives just outside the city limits of Thayer. There was one sighting that became widely accepted among law enforcement. Captain James B. Ransom, a passenger train conductor, on the Livenworth, Lawrence and Galveston Railroad, gave an accurate description of the family, stating that they had bought tickets for the northbound train to Humboldt. John Jr. and Kate then took the MK and T train south to the end of the line in the Red River country of Texas, and from there they were said to have travelled to an outlaw colony in either Texas or New Mexico. It was a tough lawless region from which many lawmen pursuing outlaws never returned. Ma and Pa had continued north to Kansas City, and it's believed that they purchased tickets for St. Louis. Ultimately, though, there's only one known fact, which is that these people were ruthless butchers and thieves. They were never captured, but fled and vanished, leaving behind them nothing but bodies, rumours and speculation about their fate. The full extent of their crimes remains unknown, and to this day, the story of the Bloody Benders is one of the greatest unsolved mysteries of the Old West. Notorious in their time and a fascinating part of American crime history, the Benders have been mentioned in various books, documentaries, horror fiction and some TV and films. However, they are less known than other serial killers of that era, such as Belle Gunnis and H.H. Holmes. One possible reason for this is that the Benders operated in a remote, rural, isolated area of Kansas in an era before widespread news reporting and mass communication. Belgonis and H.H. H. Holmes both committed their crimes in or closer to densely populated areas, which made it easier for the press to cover their crimes and spread news of their atrocities. Finally, the Bloody Benders simply may not have had the same level of cultural appeal as other serial killers. The Bender Mound is marked by a plaque placed by the Kansas Historical Society. 
Three of the Bender's Hammers, remaining artefacts from the inn, are displayed in the Cherry Vale Museum, and the historical Bender Farm was recently on auction. The Bender's Cabin was demolished long ago, and the property holds no visible signs of the farm's gruesome history. However, the land has never been scanned for bodies, so we can only imagine what horrors may lie beneath. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe, hit the bell, leave a comment. And if you find yourself weary from travelling and the nearest thing is a wooden hut with a shady looking family stood outside, please just call a fucking cab and find a reputable hotel. Thank you to Ethan from the Kansas Historical Society for helping me to confirm some facts. Kill Sims.